Hi, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, it will be about the uh, three most common uh, dermatology presentation to be presented by our dear guest, uh, Dr. Johnny. Uh, he's a founding member of Primary Care Dermatology Society in Ireland, and he's also assistant program director in the Midwestern Family Medicine Training Program. So welcome, Johnny. Uh, Thank you, Ahmed. Yeah, I hope everybody will enjoy this session and we want it to be uh, uh, more interactive since it is more like uh, slides. So uh, uh, please everybody feel free to ask to stop anytime. Uh, just unmute your mic, then you can ask any question and we will try to give you some questions also. I'll give you the mic. Okay, to go so, Ahmed. <clears throat> yeah, let's start, yeah. please. Yeah, Johnny, you can go ahead, yeah. And you can yes. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So I'm going to present a few cases from dermatology for you. If you could have a look at these three children different colored skin, but they all have the same condition. They all have itch. And I want you to look at the pictures and try and see, decide what do you see? And remember all these babies have itch. And what would you diagnose their condition as? Will I get some responses to that, Ahmed? Yeah, can I but anybody just comment on these uh, three pictures from the audience? Uh, from the resident side, anybody want to volunteer? Just to say, if people are a bit shy to speak, uh, you can certainly just type a, an answer up into, I see a few people putting some up there now, into yeah. the chat. So somebody here has said chicken pox, somebody else had said sandpaper rash. So anybody else want to put something up on the chat that they think it might be? Um, and then Johnny can, can chat you through it again. Yeah, sandpaper rash, eczema. So what kind of skin lesion that you can see? You can just comment by typing there or by your voice. Yeah, okay, topic dermatitis, eczema. Yeah. Papule, macule, okay. Yes, we are in the good direction. Will I take it over, so Ahmed? Sure, yeah. Well, I think if you, if you look at the baby on the right, yes, macules, but they're very pigmented macules. Um, the baby in the middle, very dry skin, uh, very rough skin. I presume that's what you mean by sandpaper. And the baby on the right who is white skin is much more red, scaly. And those people who made the suggestion that this was atopic eczema, that's the correct diagnosis in this case. So from just looking at it, you can tell what the diagnosis is, especially in the baby who's itching. And I'm just going to show a few other slides where atopic eczema can show up, but maybe not with those um, types of findings. And this is where the eczema is more around the follicles and more like little bumps of what we call papules. But this can still be very itchy, so do watch out for that, especially in darker skin types. And just another eczema, we'll talk about eczema for a little bit. Eczema tends to start in babies at about six weeks and it tends to start on the face. This little baby has um, red background rash and lots of scaling and itching and it's eczema starting on the face, and then it tends to spread down to the wrist, 
are the Amal ankles <laughs> and then maybe on the neck in older children and as people get older into teenage years and even into adulthood the eczema gets more in the front of the elbows maybe back of the knees but it can be anywhere and just to look at this picture here I want you to see how the skin markings are increased that's the lines on the skin are more exaggerated and that's a very typical sign to help you diagnose eczema the skin is very dry and um, thickened it's thick when you feel it so what would we do in uh, primary care to treat eczema and uh, the more most important problem our, our, our uh, most important treatment is uh, topical steroids and emollients. Emollients are something to moisturize the skin. <laughs> and also, we sometimes use immune modulators, um, sometimes antibiotics, but very rarely do we use antihistamines. And I'll just go through some of those treatments for you. Moisturizers are very important, and we I, I advise you maybe a bath, five minutes in the bath daily, and moist, with a moisturizer as a wash, and no soap and no shampoos in the bath. And this is very effective treatment. Emollients are very important to hydrate the skin, and it's important to keep them for that function. Steroids, topical steroids, are used as an anti-inflammatory and we should use those on where the skin is inflamed only. The moisturizer can go everywhere, but the topical steroid should really be used only on the inflamed skin. Moisturizers come in various um, formulations. We can have liquids, which are lotions, they're nice to use, but not quite as effective. Creams are still nice to use, but not as effective as ointments. Ointments are greasy and they're most effective, but patients find them least acceptable. And you have to be careful when you use moisturizers or emollients. We use the term um, to mean the same thing. They can cause irritation. So it's an individual thing about people. And when we advise people what moisturizer to use, you've got to use the greasiest one possible, but the one that the patient can tolerate. And this baby was irritated by a particular moisturizer. So they, they have to choose which one is best. When you deal with eczema, most eczema you'll see in primary care is a dry eczema. And that should be treated with an ointment formulation of topical steroid. For wet eczema, which is not so common at all, it's un more unusual, oozy, wet, acute eczema, we would use creams because they help dry the skin. And now it's accepted that topical steroids can be used just once a day is sufficient for pretty well all the formulations. One good layer a day of the, uh, of the ointment is sufficient. Now, we classify the steroids because they do vary quite considerably in their potency and, of course, in their side effects. And we use mild hydrocortisone, we use moderate clobetazone, we use a potent betamethasone, and a very potent clobetazone. We very rarely use clobetazole, the very potent one, in babies or children. We very rarely, in fact, use betamethasone because they can tend the skin, but we use a lot of moderate topical corticosteroids in children and more, the more potent ones we would keep for the body and the limbs in adults and teenagers. And you'll probably have to work out yourself what steroids you have available in your country uh, and what, what potency they have, because there's a total difference between mild and very potent ones. And the problem is, if you put um, holes on the very important ones in some areas of the skin, you can get problems. And this is where somebody has put a very potent steroid in a patient's axilla, 
and it's called stretch max. So use the potency, I would say on the face, you must use Umavet. On the body, you can use Betnavet, that's for an adult. For a baby, we would use um, hydrocortisone on the face and Umavet on the body. I'm just going to go mute for a moment. Now, we use tacrolimus for facial eczema, especially around the eyes. Can you hear me, Ahmed? Yeah, we hear you fine, Johnny. You okay, fine? I'll keep going. Okay, yeah. that keep going. Yeah. yeah, keep going. And when you use, I don't know if you have tacrolimus in your your country, you have to be careful that patients don't have an infection. And the patient on the left has a bacterial infection with Staphylococcus. It's yellowish at the edges. It's crusting and it's oozing. The patient on the right has a simplex infection um, and you shouldn't use tacrolimus on those patients but otherwise tacrolimus is very useful around the eyes because we don't like topical steroids immediately around the eyes because they can give glaucoma and cataract. Uh, Dr. Johnny, is this a complication from the uh, eczema itself or from the drug the tacrolimus? Sorry, sorry, I didn't get that clearly. Yeah, the, this uh, complication as infection, is it because of the disease itself or by the, uh, uh, the drug, the tacrolimus? It's really a problem for patients with eczema, atopic eczema especially. They don't seem to fight the bacteria infections and some of the viral infections, especially Staphylococcus aureus. But then not only have they an inherent problem, in other words, the eczema promotes the infection, the infection can make the eczema worse. And then if you come along and you use an immune suppressant treatment like tacrolimus, um, it can make the situation worse again. So you have to keep thinking, is there infection present? Okay? Okay. Now, one other concept is we always tend to, when we treat this little fellow with um, uh, steroids, humivet uh, even around the mouth and in his hand, the eczema can get better. But then if we stop the treatment, it gets worse again. And that has brought up the idea of preventative treatment. And we'll give you these slides and you can see them. And basically it, what it involves is using the treatment twice per week on an ongoing basis on normal skin when you have it under control to keep it under control. And that's called um, suppressive treatment. So we would use moisturizers every day to keep the skin moist and steroids on maybe two days a week, but that's when you have the condition under control and you want to keep it under control. Just to look, as Ahmed was saying, about from viral infections, this is eczema herpeticum, which can be really, really very serious in babies. It's where the herpes virus, they also don't seem to fight this very well, babies with atopic eczema, and it sets off the eczema very nastily. And it's an indication for admission. And we did cover it on the um, information on your course, with, with which uh, the details are on the last, second last slide today that you can check out about it. Um, they also get a Coxsackie virus, which is hand, foot and mouth disease, which can be very uh, extensive in children, but is not a severe illness like eczema herpeticum is and molluscum contagiosum, which is also a viral illness, can be quite severe in eczema patients. Now, I'm just going to give you a case here and see, can you have a look at these pictures of the patient? One 
on the left is the front of their elbow and this one is the front of their ankle. So it's a 12 year old who has eczema. It's itchy, it's painful, and there's been no improvement, even though you're using potent steroids. Um, just think, what do you see when you look at the pictures? And why do you think the child isn't improving? Can I pose that picture, uh, that question to you? Ahmed and your group. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, everybody, uh, uh, as you can see the picture. So, can you just describe uh, what what do you see in the picture? Just type in or unmute and talk. What eczema? Scratch mark. Liquefaction and scoriations. This is. The lichenified legion. Yeah. Most, uh, due to chronic eczema. The reason for non improving, maybe the child not test well uh -huh. or not compliance. Or maybe he need, uh, or uh, if he treated well, he need to go yani, to further step like uh, systemic therapy, I think. If not improving with topical. Yeah, this is nice. This is. The, the, the picture on the right and, or on the left, or both? Uh, the left, the liquefied region. Yeah, the liquefied, okay. So this is so nice. Uh, somebody wrote here, infection. If you want uh, uh, to comment as infection, do you see any sign of infection? Uh, here in the left side, uh, picture on the left side, it's appear like erythematous with, with the scale, uh, scaly rash. So uh, this scale it uh, 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 makes like a, uh, a scaly yellow rash, and this is maybe due to infection. This is uh, so maybe a secondary infection to to the eczema. This is what I think uh, according to the left picture. So Ahmed, yeah. Back to you, I think people, and people are picking up the correct thing. The yes, are, sure. Is, yeah. It has this absolute lovely signs of secondary infection. The, yes. If the person has atopic eczema, they're not fighting Staphylococcus aureus very well. And the Staphylococcus has given them that golden color. And that, that's not scratch marks, they're fissures. And when you see fissures, as we call cracks in the skin, it's a sign of um, infected eczema. Also, eczema isn't, doesn't tend to be painful and when it's sore we suspect infection. And when it's not improving with topical steroids, we should also suspect infection. On this side, yes, somebody mentioned I think it's very lichenified. It is lovely, very thick and lichenification. That says it's eczema, but it's open, broken skin, oozing, always think infection. So, very good. I'll move on. So, yeah, Staphylococcus aureus is the infection. Uh, kindly, are... I have a question, please. Yes? Uh, uh, in the um, uh, eczema, so uh, in the treatment of eczema, uh, you mentioned before, uh, before tacrolimus and uh, bimicrolimus. So, based on what I chose the medication, even tacrolimus or bimicrolimus, what's the difference? And based on what I choose this uh, medication or other? Um, I, I didn't get the full question. I know it's about tacrolimus, isn't it? Yes, yeah. tacrolimus and bimicrolimus. So, just so, asking, yeah. just yes. asking Johnny, which of the two, how does he choose which of, which of those drugs well, have to have the other yes. ones we should use? Thanks. It, we, have, we have no choice in Ireland because we only have tacrolimus. Tacrolimus is probably the first choice because it's more potent. And mm -hmm. amicrolimus is not as potent. But, uh, and so if you've got the choice, I would go for tacrolimus. Uh -huh. Thank you, clear. Okay. And w with the problem with infection, we, we use bleached bats or Milton bats. And again, I have the details there and it's how to use them. But we use them quite a lot. There's much more uh, of an emphasis on them in the last few years. There's some debate now about are they really as effective, but in clinical practice, we still find them effective for infection. And there's much less 
um, emphasis put on treating the infection with oral antibiotics and much more emphasis put on using the topical um, emollients and steroids to keep it under control, keep the eczema under control. And as Ahmed was saying, is it the, the treatment or is it the um, illness that's causing it? But if you can get the illness under control, you can control the infection. So we're moving on. I'm going to put another question. Can you look at these two pictures? One on the left and one on the right. One is from a person with dark skin. That's their coccygeal, the very low back area. And this is a, on the thigh of a white skinned person. And again, have a look at the rashes. What do you think they are? They don't itch. And when the person comes in, they say, no, it doesn't itch. Neither of these patients are itching. So can I ask you, what do you see? Okay, people. Can you see the, uh, these pictures? Any comments? Uh, scaly plagues, psoriasis, this is the diagnosis. What else? Purple scaly plagues, psoriasis, silver scaling, yes, it's on the left side. What do you see in the right side? I know maybe the left one is very obvious, but the uh, right side, silver scale. Erythema marginatum, maybe. Erythema marginatum, you are a little bit far away. Uh, I'm quite sure there is uh, erythema, but it is not the uh, I take it on so, Ahmed. Yeah, sure. What I would like to say, this is a very common condition. So this is psoriasis, maybe 3% of the world population have it. So it's very important to diagnose it. And I would say both rashes are very sharp margins to them. Okay, very discreet or sharp margins. Both patients have silvery scale. The white person isn't as obvious, but the silvery scale is obvious here. And if you feel them at the edges, you'll feel they're slightly raised up. So they're plaques and they're not itchy. And pretty well, that's a very good sign that this is psoriasis. And I'm just going to show you how it differs again from that person we had with the lichenified eczema. There's no real border to the eczema. There's no silvery scale. It's thickened and it's itchy. And it's, we said, mark, skin markings are exaggerated. Not so generally in psoriasis, to tell them apart. One problem with people with where the darker colored skin, they can get hyperpigmentation, increased pigment color. And the pink, especially in Western countries, we find it often hard to pick up when the disease is active. We expect to see red, but red and indicating disease activity is not so easy to see. And they also get hypopigmentation. And you've got to be careful with people of skin, with skin like this, in all dermatology conditions, because if you put on potent or very potent steroids, they can depigment the skin. So you've often got to tell people, don't go on too long with it. You may cause more problems with pigmentation, especially. So what do we do for um, psoriasis? Uh, and what would we do for these people in Dr. practice? Johnny? Yes. For joining, can we go back one slide, please? One slide. Yeah, before. Well, before. I'm, before. No, the... Yes. Uh, can you please comment on the right one? Because some people they are some confused yeah. about the diagnosis and the features there. I think. It's, it's not an annular rash. Somebody mentioned annular. When annular rashes usually have just a rash at the edge and clearing at the middle, it's raised up off the surface. It's probably going to be there for quite some time. It's a good trick if, if you have, give a little scratch with your finger, not too rough, just a gentle scratch, and you often turn the scale that's like there into the scale that's over here. You exaggerate the scale. You, you bring it up, you, it lifts off the skin. But, and the colour, we would call that, it's supposed to look like the flesh of a salmon. So we call it salmon pink rather than red. 
and when we, a, a discrete patch like that, we would say psoriasis. Okay? Sure, thank you. Okay. So emollients are very important. We've done them, uh, they talked about the emollients, the greasier the better. The other products we, we would use would be vitamin D analogs. And I, a bit of, I'll talk a little bit about steroids, but I won't go and talk about ditronol because time constraints and tar either. And I think for those two patients we saw up there, our treatment would be a combination of putting them on a steroid plus a vitamin D product. So both those patients, we would use a steroid plus a vitamin D product. And you can get that, we can get it as Dovabet, which is a combination product, so they only have to use it once a day. Of course, they use the emollients all the time. And we, but we can sometimes combine another vitamin D product that we have, Calcitriol. Uh, you could put that on the morning and Betnavet in the evening. And that's the core, really, of managing plaque psoriasis. We're not very good, we don't have very effective treatment, and if it's any way extensive, beyond 15-20% of the body surface, you probably will have to refer them to secondary care. Do be careful if the psoriasis is irritated, irritated. you might need to use moisturizers to settle it down, calm it down, it's very angry and red instead of that pink colour we were looking at there. So just give a, a, a moisturiser for a week and it can help greatly to calm it down. Um, and do be careful with steroids. This is a girl who had psoriasis and she was putting steroids on and then covering them with a film of cling film we call it and you can see the problems. This is skin atrophy and you can see her veins through it. This is a girl of only 20 and she, you can see all the veins through it and she's got lots and lots of really marked skin atrophy from using the steroids like that. So steroids under, under a wrap for a long period of time can cause problems. The problem with steroids and psoriasis is don't stay on it, the steroid, for too long because you get less of a response to it and that's called tachyphylaxis and of course be careful where you put the steroid don't put a potent steroid in the axilla on the groin or on the face and i'll show you what we tend to do in ireland um i'm just going to move on for the sake of time um that's just a, a lady with an inflamed um psoriasis on her scalp she's used a Dovabet gel formulation that we use for the scalp which is a vitamin d plus a steroid the same as you do for the body, and you can see it has been very effective for her. When we talk about flexures, we mean where the skin meets the skin. And this is a person's lower back going down towards the anal area. And this is flexure psoriasis, and it just shows that there's no scale. It's got a little fissure, which is quite common, a little crack up at the where the skin fold is. But again, it's quite sharp. But when you look at the psoriasis up here, it's like the psoriasis we've been looking at all along. The psoriasis on the lower back, very scaly. So it looks different. And on the face, which is very unpleasant, I'm going to... Turn. And for psoriasis of the face, in those flexures and on the genital area, we would still advise an emollient once a day, but we would use um, a steroid and use Umavet or Clobetazone. It's a mild steroid, not the more uh, potent steroids, and certainly not the more potent steroids, because they will cause um, skin thinning. And we can combine that with a vitamin D product on its own. You can't use the combined product that has the steroid and vitamin D in it uh, in these areas because the steroid is too potent. You've got to mix, mix it in. Umavet is quite safe and it does work very well. This is a groin rash of, um, of psoriasis and this is what we got from that person by using a combination of emollients, clobetazone in the morning, and silkus in the evening. And then you can cut down the steroid after a while and continue with the vitamin D analog. There's no time constraint on that. And I'm just going to flick through a quick look at some nail signs. Very little we can do about nail psoriasis, unfortunately. But you can see pitting. You've learned all these in medical school, probably. Pits in the nails. 
lifting of the nails. And again, it's a good idea to get people to cut back their nails, file back their nails as best as possible because they're going to get trauma. And if they lift their nails, they'll make the psoriasis worse underneath it. And that's onycholysis. They can get this kind of oil. It looks like a drop of oil underneath between the lifted nail and the bound down nail. And we call that the oil drop sign. And they can also get splinter hemorrhages from lifting of the nail. And this is a person who's doing manual work and another man who's doing manual work, splinter hemorrhages. Some people can get worried that they might be a sign of endocarditis, but in psoriasis, they're just a sign of the psoriasis of the nails. And of course, you can get thickened plaques, as we call of psoriasis underneath it. Uh, very difficult. We sometimes use a vitamin D and maybe a very potent uh, scalp application. And this is one person where that did help. But again, uh, you may have to refer to secondary care if people are bothered about it. Mm -hmm. Always remember arthritis, 25% of people with psoriasis get an inflammatory arthritis. And you may have to keep thinking and asking them, have you got pain in your joints, stiffness, in the morning and re be ready to refer them early to buy uh, for maybe consideration of systemic treatment to rheumatology. So 25% have psoriatic arthritis. And just to be on the watch out, this is a lady who has very unstable psoriasis and I would say very difficult to treat in the community. And this is the same lady at another time and her psoriasis is really all over her body. This is a man with his psoriasis pretty well all over the body. And they're what we call erythroderma, erythroderma, red all over the body. And really, it's better to refer them straight away to secondary care because we can't really manage them. They need systemic treatment straight away. Okay. Johnny, just as a question there, it just came in on the chat. Um, uh, the question is, the psoriasis on the flexures looks like eczema. How do we differentiate? Did you get that? Well, I'll, I'll just go back to the, the, the little picture of it, maybe. Um, what, what, yes, it is very, very difficult to differentiate it. And often we, we look, we'll look for psoriasis somewhere else. It's got a sharp border to it. And yes, some people to tell that from seborrheic eczema can be very, very difficult at times. I think if you look for psoriasis in other parts of the body, is there scaling on the scalp? Have they got nail involvement? Is there a rash over their knees or over their elbows? That pushes you towards psoriasis if it comes up in the flexures because more than 50% of people get it in their genital area or their flexures. It can be difficult. It is still a, a, a plaque. It gets a kind of a glazed look about it, but it can be very, very difficult. Very difficult. So I, we haven't really, I think, the sharp margin, looking for psoriasis or other places, looking for signs of eczema in other places, are my only tip for that, really. Okay? Now, we're going to do just now, finally, a bit of acne. And um, I'll, um, acne is very common. And it causes a lot of problems, uh, especially in younger people. But it, we, you should not forget that acne is a chronic disease. It, came, it may last for up to 12 years. It's not just a teenager problem. So Johnny, I'm, if, I'm really sorry. Can I interrupt you there for a second? Just yeah. to go back to the, the, the psoriasis for a minute. Just another question there on the chat is, how frequently should we instruct people to use the Dover, the Dover Bet gel and until when? How, not for how long? Use it daily, once a day to start with. And we would be trying to um, cut it down after six weeks and trying to reduce, the, especially the exposure. We're really only concerned about the steroid in it and long term. And some people would like to switch down to the um, ointment of vitamin D only at that stage. But up to six weeks. It's, and, and then, but sometimes what we end up doing is after maybe, when, if it responds and it's up to six weeks, maybe using it twice a week to try and keep the rash under control. Okay. Okay. And just another question there, Johnny. Um, 
question is nail psoriasis versus onychomycosis. How can we differentiate it? <laughs> That's really difficult. Yeah. Um, really, really, really difficult. Because onychomycosis will often, uh, fungal will grow into, it's an opportunist infection and it will grow into damaged nails. So a huge number of psoriatic nails are in fact infected with the fungus. People will know that it's very difficult to get rid of the fungus. And if it, trying to get rid of it is very difficult. And unfortunately, it doesn't get rid of the underlying nail dystrophy. The re, the, 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 ultimately, you look again for signs of fungus in between the toes, especially the fourth and fifth toe, and look for signs is a fungus spreading along the sole of the foot with a scaly rash. And then if you want to, if you have the laboratory, you should take a clipping of the nail, but go as far up the nail as proximal as you can and send it to the lab. But it is very difficult. It's very difficult to eradicate it because the problem is still there and our antifungal drugs are very poor, maybe giving a clearance of 50% of people. But the recurrence rate, especially in psoriasis people, is over 50%. It's a real problem. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Johnny. Yeah, that's no. nice. Uh, uh, there is another question. Uh, do we do uh, routinely do the wood lamp examination for the uh, onychomycosis? No, wood lamp is only suitable for fungi, um, especially we on the hair, and it's not trichophyton rubrum is the one that causes most uh, nail problems, and it doesn't fluoresce. So wood's light is no good. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, then with fluoresce. So we would use it for microsporum canis. And, you know, trichophyton and other uh, trichophyton tonsillans and uh, other fungi that are spreading around the world, they do not fluoresce. So we only really get benefit out of it um, for that. Where people do use it in the groin, uh, very difficult to use it is in erythrasma, which is a bacterial infection in the groin of people who don't wash very well. And it looks kind of reddish brown and it fluoresces kind of pink with woods light. But if you do use woods light, you must have complete dark background, complete black, and you won't see it. I don't find it very useful, to be honest. Okay. okay? Okay, uh, so we reach now the third part, which is acne. So okay, I'll I'll, I'll uh, go quickly. Um, yeah. No. So you see, acne is a condition, as I say, very very common. It's of the pilocybaceous unit. So we'll just put in a little diagram here, and this is a child pre-puberty, small gland, sebaceous gland, and a hair follicle, and that's what we call the pilocybaceous unit. And in puberty, the sebaceous gland makes more oil and the outlet gets blocked. And if that blockage is superficial, but the oil still comes out, we get blackheads. And you see where we can see blackheads all over the cheek of that um, child. If the blockage is more deeper down along the outlet, the oil is collecting now and the gland is pouring it out and it gets little white heads and they're all over the place, little micro white heads as well, micro ones, and they're non-inflamed acne. And the best treatment for them is topical retinoids. I, I presume you have adapalene is the one we would use on its, uh, if we were using it on its own. If it's just non-inflamed acne, antibiotics not really indicated for that. So again, you can see um, blackheads, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that for you, because that's what you see, it's the blackheads, blackheads, and they're almost patchless. Some are getting a little inflamed, and here the microcombinants are very difficult to see sometimes in the background. But as it gets more blocked, bacteria move in, and they, feed on the sebum and they create inflammation and you get red acne. So now you're dealing with inflamed acne and that can be a papule, a red bump, but it can break down into pus and so you can get pustules. And this girl has pustules and it also just shows you the difference between um, white skin and darker skin. And always be aware that in surveys of people with darker skin, they keep getting post-inflammatory hyper 
pigmentation. And that's the problem that they identify as their major problem above any other. They're not, not quite as worried about the sore spots. And the biggest thing you can do to help people with post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation is to identify that they still have active acne going on and to treat that. And uh, we have other things that we can do. Sometimes when acne and you're treating them and it's coming along, they get little red or purpley spots on white skin with the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. But they're not scars. And I keep telling people they will go eventually. But post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation on darker skins will take longer to fade. The key is to get in and treat any active acne and keep treating it and keep it suppressed on an ongoing basis. And the big issue, one of the big issues you have to assess when you look at your acne patients is, are they scarring? And sometimes it's quite difficult because the acne is quite inflamed and that's hiding them and you've got pigmentation from old ones. And my tip is if you get a, a light and your aura scope that you examine the ears with especially and shine it, um, tangentially across the skin, you can often see the, the, the scars. Now, they're not always as obvious as these scars, which are we call ice pick scars and box scars. But the one thing in this person who's got darker skin again is to identify that they still have active acne. And the best predictor of scarring in patients with acne is, is their scarring there already? So if you see scarring, um, you have to be prepared to get more aggressive with your treatment from early on. And it might be an indication to go on oral antibiotics like doxycycline, I think you have in your country for their acne. Um, and you really have to get anti-inflammatory treatment, which is the antibiotic in there as early as possible. You get other types of scarring, especially on the trunk. We call them kind of like saucer-shaped um, um, scars, which we call rolling scars. And you can get little atrophic scars, which are just a little bit of thinning of the skin. But sometimes the scars, all those scars were reduced fibrous tissue in the scars. But sometimes the fibrous tissue can increase. And if that fibrous tissue stays within the margins, of the scar, it's a hypertrophic scar. If it goes outside it, we call it a keloid scar. And again, very difficult to manage. Uh, so you have to be on the watch out. Um, if anybody has got that type of scarring, make sure you get their inflammatory acne under the best control. So I think you've got to uh, 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 assess each patient and you'll have these pictures of the information. What type of lesion have they? Are they just blackheads and whiteheads, non-inflamed? You'll use retinite. If they're inflamed, you might use more anti-inflammatory therapy, and we'll talk about that. Um, and the psychological impact is very important. And scarring, as I said, and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation on people with skin, darker skins, may be a big issue for them. And the treatments we have, I'm just going to cover the top three more than anything else. Benzyl peroxide is recommended first line in all guidelines around the world. So are retinoids. Topical antibiotics are pushing down the recommendation list because we don't like use overuse and antibiotics. And I'll tell you why. Benzyl peroxide, it's a non-antibiotic antimicrobial microbial agent so you don't get resistance to it it kills bacteria um, and gets down the redness and the inflammation so it is quite suitable for red and inflamed acne it can be irritating and this girl put it on our face there and she got quite an eczema irritant eczema from it it can cause a bit of photosensitivity and it's a bleach, so it takes colour out of clothing and bedding quite often. So you have to warn people not to wear their most colourful clothes in their bedding or in the clothes they put on them, maybe, when you're using benzyl peroxide. Retinides, again, recommended all over the world. They're to attack blackheads and whiteheads, as we said. But all inflammatory acne was once a, a whitehead. And so it's, uh, it helps to cut down the inflammatory acne as well. And 
in people with darker skin is quite handy because it does reduce post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. It just does speed that. The body will take care of it eventually, but it does speed it. The ones we have in Ireland are Retin-A, which is tretinoin, not used that much because it's quite irritating. And I suppose the least irritating and probably the product used most is Adapalene. But they can be irritating, and retin is more irritating than Adapalene. They can be photosensitivity, so put them on at night. Anytime you have a retinite preparation, put it on at night, wash it off in the morning. And I'll just give you a tip while I'm passing through. To avoid the irritant effect, uh, it's now recommended to put all benzyl peroxide and the uh, retinides on every second night and wash them off in the morning, and to do that for two weeks at the start of your treatment, and then see can you step them up to using it every night after the two weeks. That to be avoided in pregnancy, and but they are best for blackheads and whiteheads. And these are irritating pro products. They're the main products in the world, benzyl peroxide and uh, retinoids. So we should always I'd advise a gentle, not too greasy moisturizer for patients who are using them. Um, as the lake acid, um, I don't know if you have it. It's not really very effective, but it does bring down pigmentation in post inflammatory hyperpigmentation, and it is very well tolerated and it is safe in pregnancy. So it is a product you might think of using. Unfortunately, it's not very effective against acne. And so what we often like to do is because everybody, people who come in with acne have tend to have the red spots and white spots, the blackheads, whiteheads, and the inflamed acne. So they tend to come in with a mixture. And if it's a, a, a mixture of the two and it's not very severe, we might go for topical combined treatments. And they, they, they would be very much, and Epiduo is one that we use now a lot of. We didn't have it in Ireland until about two years ago, but most of the world have had it for quite some time. Again, it's got Adapalene in it and benzyl peroxide. It can be irritating. So again, every second night, put it on to stop it, wash it off in the morning. Um, and some people would use a retinite. Um, Retin-A has been reformulated uh, in this form, Triclin, which is an antibiotic plus a retinoid. The one rule with antibiotics uh, topically in acne is not to put them on on their own. Combine them with a retinoid or with a benzoyl peroxide. And this is it combined with a retinoid. And the second person is much more inflamed, but still moderate acne. And again, Epiju can be number one. But if you do go for a combination product, probably go for benzyl peroxide, which is more anti-inflammatory along with the antibiotic. And when you put the two into one preparation, they only have to use it once a day, compliance increases, and they really work synergistically and you'll get good responses from them. But watch out for irritation. More severe acne, um, Treatment prescribed. We'll give one more question uh, as part of the discussion. Is that okay, Ahmed? Hello? Yes, Johnny. Yeah, okay. This is a question. 18 year old man, what treatment would you prescribe in your practice for this man with his acne? So, people, as you can see in, the, in this picture, the features in the face, in the trunk, uh, also in the neck. So, what do you advise as a treatment? Please type in or speak by voice. We can prescribe systemic isotretinoin. Okay, this is one of the modalities. Any other modality? Systemic antibiotic or isotretinoin, oral retinoic acid, oral antibiotics. Isotretinoin. Okay. okay, Johnny. Okay. No, I wouldn't go for isotretinoin straight away. I think you should try antibiotics orally, as Ahmed was saying there, as a first line. Always when you use an oral antibiotic, you should use a topical treatment with it. You can use Epiduo. 
you can use benzyl peroxide. Benzyl peroxide helps reduce resistance developing to the oral antibiotic. So what we should use in this man actually was epiju at night and with an antibiotic. The one we use in Ireland more is um, limacycline, but it's equivalent to the one you have. You have doxycycline. Haven't you got that, Ahmed, in your country? Yeah, we have doxycycline, we have erythromycin, yeah. and trimethyl I, I put a line through erythromycin because resistance develops so quickly that we hardly ever use it now. And medicine has problems with side effects, with lupus, in case you have it. But doxycycline is a fine drug. And 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 and, and it, it'll it'll work fine. Um, and if you if you were in the country, we lamotrigine is another one. But second choice would be trametoprim, uh, at a dose of six hundred milligrams a day. But that is off license. And if you, we have to be aware all over the world about re reducing resistance. And you can see the steps you can take. And you might come back to look at those again. And because I'll move on. Um, with the pigmentation, again, I'll just mention the things we can use for post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation because it's such an issue for people with darker skins. And get the condition under control if you can. If you're going to use a retinite, try adapalene, but try not to irritate and do use it with a moisturizer. And we use quite a lot of azelaic acid in that case because it will help the acne. It's not irritating and it will help the pigmentation. And lots of countries, but we don't, not, neither does the UK, have a thing called Kligman, Kligman solution and hydroquinone, but uh, I'm sure you have it probably. I know it's available in a lot of Asian countries and in America, but not readily available to us, but people will, will use that. So that's the end of my talk. And if anybody has any questions, Yes, Johnny. They want to raise Ahmed. Yeah, yourself? I think we have a lot of questions uh, regarding this interesting uh, uh, topic. So let us uh, start one by one, and Johnny will uh, uh, answer them, please. I'll, I'll uh, answer them. Yeah. Why? I might, I might just ask you. I, I I don't hear some of the questions very clearly, and you could just clarify them for me, maybe at times. Yeah, so the first one, why we wait for scars to start aggressive management? No, uh, the, 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 the key to managing scarring is be aggressive very early. Yes. And don't wait for scars. Scars, the reason I, what I was saying there was if you see scarring, yes, that is absolutely an indication for aggressive treatment. But that's not the only indication. Um, you know, if, if it is absolutely proven now, early, as aggressive as you need to be, treatment is the best to prevent scarring. So no, it's not just for when scarring is there, you should be aggressive. You should be aggressive when the acne is severe. The, 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 the tendency has been in the, in the recently with those combined products that we have, we can actually get a lot of acne under good control, moderate acne, without going to antibiotics. But any scarring, I would say, absolutely, I could go for antibiotics very, very quickly. Within six weeks, if you didn't get a response to your first line treatment, in six weeks, I would think, yes, go for oral antibiotics. And that's even for very, very, very mild scarring. Severe scarring and severe lesions, aggressive lesions, go early. Okay. Uh, is it reasonable or possible to start the oral isotretinoin for the moderate acne to avoid the scars? Well, you would hope that you, to avoid the scar. You see, only some people will scar, and it's quite a lot of people. And yes, we should always be thinking. I think, I, I don't know, do you prescribe Do you prescribe them in primary care, Roaccutane, in Saudi Arabia? No, usually it is I, I call it Roaccutane, it's isotretinoin. Yeah, it's usually by a dermatologist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I would say if you see Mark scarring, um, refer maybe for consideration of isotretinoin, especially if the patient has big nodules 
really big nodules and big cysts. But while you're waiting for the appointment, I don't know how long you would be waiting, but certainly in Ireland you would be waiting, you should still start oral antibiotics and topical treatment. I would go with Epiduo, and even if it's very, very severe acne, or if somebody didn't really want to go on Rakuten because they read about the side effects of it, either tretinoin, I should call it, not rather Rakuten, if they are worried about the side effects, I, I would sometimes use double antibiotic. So doxycycline, 100 milligrams, BD and Epiduo uh, at night rub is uh, very effective for severe acne as well. But uh, even if, you're, if there's a wait for the appointment, certainly get them on the best treatment we have in primary care. Uh, this will come up with another question uh, for antibiotic. Uh, why usually we don't use it alone? We use combination uh, always. Why? Big re two reasons. Number one, combinations work better than a single agent. Okay. And but the big big reason is that that um, antibiotics benzyl peroxide reduces resistance. It's a very good killer of bacteria. If you rub benzyl peroxide on your skin and you have resistant bacteria on it, within five days it kills off the majority of them. It is really maintaining. Um, antibiotic sensitivity and stopping resistance. And one thing that we didn't get to say, when you stop an antibiotic, you should continue with products like Epijo or benzyl peroxide or um, different, uh, that's adapalene, for, uh, as a maintenance treatment for a while. Now, teenagers don't do that for you, but it is a good idea that they stay on their non antibiotic treatment as a maintenance and staying on the benzyl peroxide especially after coming off an antibiotic helps to kill off any resistant bacteria that might have developed okay so uh, what is the best treatment as uh, you advise for the blackheads if patients best have treatment. only blackheads I'm afraid you know, people do get blackhead extractors on the internet and they can do that. Blackheads don't really go on to develop inflammatory lesions. They're, they're open, uh, they're op what we call open comedones. The best treatment is topical retinoids, but it's not brilliant. Um, benzyl peroxide has very little effect and antibiotics have very little effect on it. Okay, uh, there is another question. Uh, uh, when do you usually uh, see the response from topical therapy? Is it one month, two months? It, it is slow and I always tell people really if they have severe acne and it's not improved by six weeks to eight weeks I tell them come back because some acne can get really bad quite quickly but I think if they could try two months they have to be patient and because they're um, um, adolescents and teenagers, they, don't, they want a quick fix, they to be better off. And I say, no, this is not a split, this is a marathon. And they must be prepared to go with the treatment. But you would like to see some improvement after um, two, uh, definitely two months and maybe six weeks. And if it, there's no improvement in two months, you probably have to, if you're using topicals, maybe go for orals. Yeah. I would like your patient, Dr. Johnny. I have a lot of questions. And okay, I, I have no problem. <laughs> yes. You know, there is one question about if we have a female, and this is the usual presentation, uh, if she has only one pimple, so what we can offer for her? Yeah, I know. One pimple can be almost <laughs> incompatible with life for some patients. <laughs> yes. Um, and, 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 but, but you see, we, that brings in the psychology of it. And what we think is not a major problem on the face can be a major problem for some people. And I would say what a pimple is, I would try and encourage just to use topical treatment. Of just one, but sometimes it is very mild. And I'm afraid we have to be realistic and say the limitations of our treatment. And I would say, if it's a blackhead or a whitehead, I would say, look, we'd, we'd go with uh, the, the topical treatment um, if they wanted to use something. Uh, and, and, and just try and encourage them to go with it, bear with it, and we'll see how it goes. And if it, because some people come in and ask for isotretinoin 
very early and you say, no, it's not indicated, but you must understand where the patient is coming from and try and acknowledge their distress. Nice. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Right. Any more questions? Uh, now, no yeah. problem about questions. I'll stay on as long as you want me. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is the usual duration for antibiotic uh, use? Three months? Well, the, uh, the, world, uh, the, the uh, um, European and, and American guidelines would be after three months of using antibiotic, either topical or oral, that you should review it. Now, all the experts will say, what happens? Well, you can't actually stop it at three months. You want to still use it. But definitely long-term repeating prescriptions is not the best idea. And some people would say, that's the time we should really use Roaccutane or Isotretinoin. Isotretinoin has a great advantage that it can cure the acne. It can stop acne and not bring the acne not come back. It doesn't do it for everybody, but it does it for a very high percentage of people. So if people are using antibiotics over years, you know, we said it's a chronic condition. And if they're using it for over years, maybe um, isotretinoin should be considered. But certainly think about it after six, uh, after three months, after the antibiotic. Majority do can't and won't. And Certainly, at about six months, try it. But in between, if you're getting nowhere, just review and move on. And for the female patients, I didn't go into it because of time. Uh, you may have to look at the contraceptive pill and, and how that could affect their acne. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, there is another question about diet and acne. Is there any relation between diet and acne, uh, either in management it's or as a risk factor? Yeah. The, the, main, uh, the main problem with the diet is not thought to be a big factor. We do recommend a low glycine weight loss diet. That's particularly people who are overweight and it's for um, people in 20s and 30s, female who may have polycystic ovary syndrome and have a lot of maybe uh, obesity. Yes, that get losing the weight can help. But generally, losing weight for teenagers, no role. People ask about dairy products. Do people drink a lot of milk in Saudi Arabia? Yeah. Well, if they drink milk, um, they sh we shouldn't really drink skimmed milk. That's where all the cream is taken from the milk. And people tend to put in proteins, which actually uh, we call whey protein from milk and whey protein is not good for acne and so we say if you drink milk drink um a good cream milk <laughs> you know that, that, and but in moderation that people a, a liter a day for teenagers is no problem other dairy products has no problem if they eat chocolate do it in moderation but if they go into a duty-free shop and buy a big bar of chocolate and eat it can actually flare up their acne but again moderation uh, so very that? little role of diet. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any role for laser treatment in acne? Well, there's been increasing use of light treatments, and not only not not so much laser. Laser is more used for the scarring, and I, I yeah. don't use lasers, but lasers are more common there. But light treatment has been used, not very effective. It, it kills the bacteria. The bacteria absorb the light um, and it, it, it basically cooks them and kills them. But they come back again. And some of the cynics would say benzyl peroxide does the same. And it costs about uh, 1,000 the price. Mm -hmm. So they're working on lasers, but not at the moment. But for scarring, maybe you, you, you can consider it. Nice. Uh... Uh, have another question about hormonal therapy. Yeah, I, I, I did leave that out. Hormonal therapy for women. Yes, you should look at what um, contraceptive they are using. We don't like people using the um, uh, depot progesterone systems. We use an implant on bar in, uh, in Ireland and we use um, an, an intramuscular injection. They can really produce quite severe acne in about 10% of patients. So estrogen is really nice for acne. Really? Progesterone, Hello? maybe not so nice. Yes? Yeah, oh, continue. Um, 
No, I'm sorry, I just might. Um, so I, our, 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 our ideal one would be something with Cyprotron. What brand name? Have you got Yasmin or Yaz? Yes, we have Jasmine. Yeah, Jasmine, but, yeah. but probably cyproton acetate is an anti-androgen, so that's the type of pill we would prefer. And the other one is cyproton. We, we call it Dianet. I don't know if you have it in Saudi Arabia. That's the one we find is the best. Yeah. <coughs> I believe it is uh, very effective for the young uh, females, Johnny. For all, yeah, for adult females, yes. And they often don't do well with topicals or antibiotic treatment but they can do well on hormonal treatment but it's very slow to work and it can take up to six months to work so you have to bear with it and if it was severe acne and it's clear she's got scarring we say she should really use topical uh, treatment and oral antibiotics until the hormone clicks in and starts work for her Okay. Is there any relation between acne and uh, systematic diseases like Cushing or uh, any other diseases? Well, the first time in my life, about three weeks ago, I met a, a, a young girl with Cushing syndrome and she did present with acne. And it was only when she had stria all over her body that we copped down that it was uh, related to Cushing. So underlying uh, endocrine disorder, the most common endocrine disorder, um, it's really for females, um, is polycystic ovary syndrome, and which is probably the most common endocrine disorder for women. And the vast majority of women who you test out, if you are worried about it, you should just ask yourself, is, is this acne in a woman in her 40s, late 40s, and she suddenly gets severe acne, you have to wonder, is there a, a, an underlying tumour secreting androgen? Or if a woman gets a very deep voice, or clitoromegaly, and really lots of signs of hirsutism, and especially the older woman, it's quite common to be, and quite uncommon, to have a severe, a serious underlying cause. And most uh, people who have an underlying cause, it's polycystic ovary. And you can check the testosterone level. And if the testosterone level is greater than double the upper limit of normal. Now that's for um, free testosterone. It's the best on free testosterone level in blood. Underlying condition be positive, but I did see um Cushing's recently. Okay, uh, hello, your voice was lost uh, for half a minute. Oh, yeah, right. or did, did, did I write stuff about polycystic ovaries and that? Yes, yeah, last okay, 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah, any more questions? Yeah, I have uh, two couple questions, so we'll finish after yeah. that. Uh, sorry, people, we just uh, had our limit. Is there any drug safe in pregnancy? Any? Any drug safe in pregnancy? For in acne? pregnancy, oral antibiotic, the only one that's really safe is erythromycin. But again, because there's questions about that, so I don't even use it now. There's some, we used to take definitely doxycycline and uh, limacyclin and trimacin, not safe. Topical products, yes, can use topical indomycin, benzyl peroxide. So if you have the formulation of, uh, we, we have it as Duke benzyl peroxide and clindamycin as an antibiotic, that is safe. Skinordin, azelaic acid is safe. Generally in, egg, in pregnancy, eczema can improve because its estrogen levels are so high. But I've seen about three or four women in my career where ex and, uh, the acne, I should say, where the acne got much, much worse in pregnancy. But we are very limited. No isotretinone, of course. Isotretinone, is, that's the big danger with it, is pregnancy. And topical retinoids, they're taught, they're, they're licensed not to use in pregnancy. But in fact, there's good data that if a person takes them by accident, um, they didn't realize they were pregnant and they were using a topical retinite that so far the evidence is very good that they do not harm the pregnancy. Okay, uh, last question. Uh, uh, do we use any prophylactic 
uh, treatment for acne after resolution? Do we use it any prophylactic? Well, not so much prophylactic, but definitely maintenance for people who would call maintenance, what I was talking about there will go. When you come off um, the oral antibiotics or when you come off isotretinoin, you, you should stay on topical treatment. That's the very strong recommendation. Um, and we would use, um, coming off isotretinoin, we would get people to use um, the epidu, that's the benzoyl peroxide, plus a dapolene combination. And there is proof that that will stop acne coming back. If you use, it, it also helps with the bacterial resistance and especially benzyl peroxide used after you stop an antibiotic can be used as uh, preventing the uh, acne from coming back as well as mopping up resistant bacteria. So I suppose that's type of prophylaxis, secondary prophylaxis, trying to stop it coming back again. But of course the adherence, people don't adhere to the medication, they don't comply. Uh, but we try and get them after they finish treatment, do four months of you know, non-antibiotic treatment if possible. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Johnny, for this uh, nice and informative uh, uh, lecture about the uh, acne, psoriasis, and eczema. And we hope that we can meet you again in another webinar uh, in the future. Uh, and I hope everybody enjoyed uh, uh, this session. Uh, now we will close. Uh, uh, any uh, uh, further questions uh, can be uh, answered by your trainers there uh, in your uh, programs. Uh, we are very sorry for the short time of this webinar, but uh, uh, I would like to thank you all for your attendance uh, and see you again. Uh, and goodbye, please. Thanks. Thank you, Johnny.